You will hear a conversation about a language course. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Borgheimer Language Courses. How may I help you? Oh yes, I contacted you some time ago about following a German course in Germany, and you advised me to take your placement test before we go any further. Well. I've done that now, so I'd like to go ahead with booking the course for this summer, if that's possible. Certainly, sir. You said you took the placement test. What was the result? I was placed at the O3 level. O3, right. That's lower intermediate. Fine, Mister. The answer is level three or lower intermediate. So the course level has been filled in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Pettersen, John Pettersen. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Pettersen? P, E, double T, E R, double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear, does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr. Pettersen. The maximum class size is twelve, but I've never known there to be more than nine or ten in a class. It could even be five or six. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day, two hours only on Saturday, Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr. Pettersen. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests, or you can stay on the university campus, or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest, and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus comes somewhere between the two price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the first of June in Hamburg, and a week later in Berlin, which is what would concern you as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the eighth of June. The next course would begin on the second of July, and then the second of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr. Pettersen. Can I have your address, please? Twenty-six, Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr. Pettersen. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me, and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer discs, translation exercises, and all that sort of thing, but you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheidt, which is more than adequate for your level. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary, not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> Now, finally, what about the cost of the course, and how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's five hundred and fifty euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr. Pettersen. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full-time student. Have you got a student card? Oh yes. Then that does make a difference. You'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to thirty-five percent off the full price, and if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Pettersen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna. I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between an IELTS candidate and an IELTS administrator. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon. I'm applying for a master's program at the University of Exeter in the UK. I'm planning to register for the IELTS exam at your centre next month. I have some questions I'd like to ask you before I register, if that's okay. Certainly. Would you be taking the academic module? I think so, but I'll have to contact the university just to make sure. You'll probably need the academic because most universities don't accept the general training, 
And anyway, the procedures to register for the exam are the same for both the general and the academic modules. Good. My first question is whether I sit all parts of the exam on the same day. I don't live here, you see. And for me, it would be more convenient to do all the papers on the same day. Hmm. Unfortunately, the speaking part is scheduled for Thursdays and reading, writing and listening tests take place on Saturdays. We can't change the days, I'm afraid. Hmm. That's a pity. Well, never mind. What sort of documents do I need to bring in order to register? You'll have to fill in the IELTS application form and bring an ID, a copy of your ID and two passport size photos on a white background. Will any ID do? We only accept original passports and national IDs. That's good to know. Did you say that reading, writing and listening are scheduled for Saturday? That's right. Will I get a break in between the papers? I'm afraid there aren't any breaks between the papers. Each paper takes an hour to complete, so it's three hours straight through. You'll first do listening and then reading followed by the writing test. This is a standard requirement from Cambridge. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. OK, and how soon after the test can I pick up my results? It takes 13 calendar days for the results to be processed. Can you let me know how much it is and the form of payment? The examination fee is 200 US dollars. You can pay by credit or debit card. We also accept cheques. We only accept cash as a form of payment in exceptional circumstances. And one last question. Can I mail you the application documents? Certainly. You can send all the documents by registered mail to our address. 47 Clover Place, New Rochelle, New York. Could you spell New Rochelle for me, please? Certainly. N E W R O C-H-E-L-L-E -L -L -E. Could I have the zip code as well? Sure. Our zip code is 10806. Thanks. You can also email us at iinquiry at examsmail.com or phone us at 325 9082. I think that's all. Thank you very much for all the information. Bye. You're welcome. Goodbye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to
to 27. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas, based upon my personal experience, that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself, what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science? This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the Dean of Academic Affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay. Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now, let me just get my pen. Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do? It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read, although Judy Newton's Choosing University Courses was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm, let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes. There was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Mm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers and I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. I've asked you here just to remind you about this Friday's field trip. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Okay, I'd like to keep this meeting as brief as possible, as I'm sure we all have things to do. I've asked you here just to remind you about this Friday's field trip. This is the first of many field trips you'll be going on, so there are a few rules I'd like to make clear now. Most importantly, I want you all to remember that simply because you are leaving the college. Does not mean that you are not studying. This is an essential part of your course and should be treated as such. There will be two assignments for you to complete whilst you are there, and some extension work you will be expected to do over the weekend. So I suggest you all pay attention on the day. Moving on, remember that we are going to a salt marsh and must dress appropriately. High-heeled shoes and t-shirts are not what I consider appropriate. You need good footwear. Preferably boots, and you should bring a waterproof jacket as the weather is unpredictable. It would also be a good idea to bring a change of clothes. There is a chance you will get wet, and a three-hour return journey in damp clothes is nobody's idea of fun. We will be on the marsh from about ten o'clock to about four, so you will be given a light lunch. However, if you want to bring any snacks with you, then please feel free to do so. Although we will be stopping for dinner on the way home. Now this is the fourth time the college has been to Park Drive Salt Marsh, and so far we have never lost a student. <laughs> However, remember that there are twenty-eight people going, and if you are late, you will be keeping myself and your colleagues waiting, and at that time in the morning you will not find me very forgiving. Please try to arrive a few minutes before seven. If you are not here on the hour, you risk being left behind. For those of you who are being collected in the evening, you can expect to be back here between 8:30 and 9 p.m. But do warn whoever may be coming for you that the traffic is unpredictable, and it may well be later. Before you go, I'll hand out your assignment papers and briefly explain what you have to do. Now, on the first page, all you are required to do is identify the flora and fauna on the page and find an example in the salt marsh. As I told you on Monday, you will need a camera for this. I recommend one of those disposable cameras rather than something more valuable, as the marsh can get very dirty. Now, on page two, you will be looking more at the bird life on the marsh. You should be able to see what you have to do for this assignment, but there will be plenty of time on the way there to ask any other questions. Well, we'll stop there, and I'll see you all on Friday morning. Oh, before you go, just a word of caution. The plants are there to be seen and photographed only. Remember that this is a protected site, and we will have to get permission for this trip. If there are any problems, we may not be allowed to go again, and you will be spoiling the opportunity for other students. Okay, if you have any questions, come and see me later today or tomorrow. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.